Our scripture reading this morning is from the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 25. Genesis 25. We've been working our way through the book of Genesis for several weeks now, maybe several months. And we continue our story of Abraham. Actually, it's the end of the story of Abraham. And uh, we're going to read the first 18 verses this morning. Hear the word of the Lord. Abraham, this is after Sarah died, we saw last week, and he sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac. Uh, We pick it up here. Abraham took another wife, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Ashuram, Latushim, and Lumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanak, Abida, and Eldah. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac, eastward to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zoar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahai Roy. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Keter, Abdeel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadad, Tema, Jeter, Naphish, and Kidma. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their villages and by their encampments. Twelve princes, according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. So far, the reading of God's word, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open. This is 25 because we're going to be referring to our text a number of times. Friends, most of us like to be positive. You know, it's nice to emphasize how much we have in common with other people and even other religions. Uh, It's important to be good neighbors, and uh, it's important to emphasize how much we have in common. But the Bible's message is actually one of conflict. Uh, Even within families, we see that there's going to be conflict between the truth and those who don't hold to God's truth. Uh, We see it here in our text. Uh, We see it between Isaac and Ishmael. We're going to see it next week between twins, Esau and Jacob. So even though we like to get along, the Bible's message is actually we can expect conflict. We can expect, as we saw in Genesis 3.15, that there's going to be enmity or conflict between the seed of the woman, God's seed, and those who do not belong to God. And even within families, where we like to focus on what unites us, there is going to be division. What is the cause of the division? Is it because some people are just mean-spirited and like to pick fights? Sometimes that's the case. But it's much more than that. It's the gospel. It's the truth of God's saving work. 
that often is the dividing line between, even within families, where there is division. We're going to see how that unfolds and what we do about it as part of that story today. Well, who knew that Abraham had so many sons, right? If, if I asked you how many sons Abraham had, you'd, you would remember Ishmael, probably, and certainly Isaac. But would you remember Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua? That's a good Bible trivia question. Probably would have stumped all of us on that, right? Uh, Abraham had quite a few sons, and quite a few sons while he was old. This is after Sarah died. But uh, these sons that we list here, they're not as famous as the two previously mentioned sons. And it says in our text that they are sent away with gifts to the east. And we saw in Genesis that whenever people go east, it's a sign of moving away from the life-giving blessing of God's presence, right? So these other sons, they travel far from God. They aren't important, really, in the big story of God's saving work. But Genesis 25 does give us an update on the two famous sons that we would have heard about, Ishmael and Isaac. And it's sort of like, we've already read about Ishmael and Isaac, right? Genesis 21, that was several weeks ago now. But it's sort of like in Genesis 25 of looking at a family photo album. Where you look at a couple of the kids when they're really young, you know, six and four. Uh, I'm the oldest of five in my family when I grew up. And I was the tallest for a while. Certainly when I was eight years old, I was the tallest of everyone. But then you look at the photographs 15, 20 years later. And you say, oh, I didn't end up to be the tallest. And, and that's what we hear, have here in our text. We see an, an updated picture of the two sons. We were introduced to them earlier in Genesis, but now we have an updated family photo, as it were. And so, since we're going to be comparing photos, let's go back briefly to Genesis 21 And we'd like to read verses 9 and 10 of Genesis 21. This is after Isaac was miraculously born to Sarah and Abraham. In verse 9 and 10 we read there, But Sarah saw that the son of Hagar the Egyptian, that is Ishmael, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, and it wasn't just laughing, it was probably teasing or provoking or even persecuting. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. The two sons of Abraham, even at a very young age, are in conflict with each other. Now we saw that this conflict in Genesis 21 actually is a picture of even a a different spiritual reality. Now we don't usually do this in scripture because... Galatians 4 clearly says that this is an allegory, and we let Paul give us allegory lessons. But in Galatians 4, he interprets the conflict between Ishmael and Isaac. And he says this is a picture of bigger things going on. And do you remember what Paul said in Galatians 4 that these two sons represent? Uh, Let's just briefly look. Galatians 4, I'm going to read verse 23, 24, and then 28 through the end. The son of the slave, that is Ishmael, was born according to the flesh, naturally. While the son of the free woman, Isaac, was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. And then the other is the the son of the promise. And then verse 28 and following. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Ishmael. Son born to Abraham through man's best efforts and planning, he represents man's attempts to gain God's blessing. 
and through our efforts to be declared a good, righteous enough person. Kind of like the lawyer that we read about in Luke 10. The person who wants to be justified by what he or she does. Contrast that son, Ishmael, the older, with Isaac. The son born to Abraham and Sarah through the miraculous work of God. Isaac represents God's work to make us righteous in God's sight. And he does so only by Christ's work, i.e. the gospel. The gospel is what God has done. It is never what we do. And these two approaches to God, religion versus gospel, like two sons, they have things in common, don't they? Religion and gospel. But ultimately, they are in conflict with each other. So, let's get an update on these two sons and these two approaches in our text today. Genesis 25. Ishmael. Named by God. What does his name mean? God hears, right? Here in verse 9, we read, He is the son of Abraham who buried Abraham at the cave of Machpelah. And we read that he has 12 sons who become 12 tribes. And ultimately, he does become a mighty nation, doesn't he? Which one of you kids knows what nation today traces their heritage back to Ishmael? It's actually all the Arabs today. And all the Arabs who have lived throughout history. Today, the number of Arabs who are alive today, 300 million. Think of how many tens of millions of Arabs have also lived throughout the ages up to this point. So pretty impressive, actually. A mighty nation. That's Ishmael. And we read about how God blesses him and how he grows strong. Then we also read about Isaac. He also, like Ishmael, is named by God, right? Not God hears, but God laughs. He is also, in verse 9, one of the sons of Abraham who buried Abraham in the cave of Machpelah. And later on, we're going to read that he will have 12 grandsons who become the 12 tribes of the Jews. If you're looking at numbers, uh, 300 million Arabs today. How many Jewish people today? About 15 million, maybe 20, depending on how, if you count married. or Anyway, so a large people but not nearly as large as Ishmael. But of the two sons, who is looking the most impressive in our chapter? Probably Ishmael, actually. Let me read verse 25, verse 18. Ishmael's 12 sons, these princes, and they settled from Havilah to Shur, opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. Havilah, what do we know about Havilah? Well, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 11, Havilah is a land where there is much gold and the gold is good. So Ishmael settles where there are riches, where there is gold and splendor. It's not an accident that it says in a text that these 12 mighty princes and cities all gravitate towards Havilah, the land where the gold is plentiful. What does Isaac have? It does say that God blessed him and Abraham gave him all that he had, but what does he have? Not as many sons. Certainly, in Genesis 25, he has none. And he lives in tents. So the two sons have similarities. But if the two sons are in conflict, which we read in Genesis 21 and Galatians 4, Who seems to be doing better? And even in our snapshot that we have today. Seems to be Ishmael. And guess what? Not only does Ishmael look better if you stack him up against Isaac here. But the thing that Ishmael represents, that is religion, also can look better and more important than the thing that Isaac represents. The gospel. 
if these two sons are pictures of two different paths, similar and yet different, where, again, Ishmael is the natural son, he's a picture of religion, of our attempts to try to be virtuous, versus Isaac, the son of promise, who is clearly here only because God has done a great work. If that's the ultimate contrast here, we still today have uh, what what Ishmael represents, that is religion, being the one that draws a lot of attention. And it's religion on the right and on the left. Uh, Religion on the left in America It's all about redeeming culture. It's all about bringing shalom and righting past wrongs. And it's pretty much what we're doing, right? Uh, Religion on the right. Same thing is about bringing God's kingdom through government. Uh, Very concerned actually about the alt-right because there are many people in our culture who see this European... A white country that has been decimated by all these invaders. And so for the alt-right, religion's goal is to restore what's been lost and what's been taken away. So you have religion on the left, you have religion on the right, and alt-right even. And look at how impressive religion can look. Certainly people sign up for that pretty quickly. Religion can discourage evil. It can encourage people to be mindful of their neighbors. It can inspire people to do sometimes very noble things. And in our cultural drama where pagan secularists want to force everybody to bow down to their idols or to be cast into the fiery furnace of bankruptcy or prison, it is tempting to put aside the gospel for the sake of making common cause with our religious neighbors. Especially if the gospel is so offensive. Let's not talk about it so much. So we have two temptations here as believers. We always have. One is promoting religion. And two is ignoring the gospel while engaged in other important work. These temptations look good like Ishmael looks good in chapter 25. But settling for religion or ignoring the gospel will not inherit the blessing of God. Why not? It's because, like Isaac, the gospel is our only sure hope. The gospel, like what Isaac represents... The gospel, like Isaac in Genesis 25, might seem unimpressive and ridiculously limited in its scope. But it's the best blessing from God. The gospel doesn't make headlines. The gospel doesn't inspire woke folks or... um, Celtic warriors to take back what's been lost. And yet, the gospel is our best hope. And even in Genesis 25, we get hints that even though Isaac isn't that impressive compared to Ishmael and all the blessings that we have listed here, we do get hints that Isaac, being the son of promise, the son of God's work, is going to inherit the better place. It's just not now. And so Genesis 25, verse 11, we read, After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahai Roy. We read Lahai Roy in Genesis 16, verse 14. That was a pivotal place in the life of Ishmael. Therefore, the well, after they were kicked out, the well that saved his life, Ishmael's life, was called Bir Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And last week in Genesis 24, 
we read the blessing of Rebecca. They blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of them. We see there are signs that the sons of promise are going to be possessing the gates of those who hate them. But it's not yet. So, let's wrap this up. Why is the gospel so important, more so than religion? Uh, One of the reasons why I'm glad we're also in Genesis 25 with this theme is we're coming up to the Protestant Reformation again. And there's a lot of talk in our circles that say, Protestant Reformation, does it really even matter anymore? Part of the reason why people ask, does it, does it matter, is because we move beyond the gospel, apparently, to all these other concerns in our culture. Why is the gospel so important? Well, friends, it's because it is a gift from God. The solas of the Protestant Reformation sum up the good news that is ultimately our most important comfort and inheritance. So, kids, I'm going to review it again. You know the solas, don't you? If you don't, you need to review them. You need to ask your mom and dad about them. Solus Christus. What does solus Christus mean? It means, unlike Ishmael, the son of the natural way to try to impress God through your own works... God is only impressed by a righteousness that comes through Christ alone. It is a righteousness that's outside of yourself. It is a righteousness that Jesus has earned and that he gives to you. So the Reformation, friends, the gospel, is all about how Christ's righteousness is the only basis that you have that gives you good relationship and the blessing with God. So, la gratia. What does that mean? Grace alone. You gain this righteousness that Christ has earned only as a gift of God. It's not whether you've proven yourself worthy. He gives it to you by his grace. How does he give Christ's righteousness by his grace? The instrument is sola fide, faith alone. You gain Christ's righteousness not by doing, but by not doing, by resting in and trusting in Christ alone. And finally, if we are blessed by God, by having Christ's perfect righteousness graciously given to us as we rest and trust in Christ. Who gets the glory for that? When they write your story, are they going to write how uh, through your woke efforts you've transformed culture and did all these wonderful things in our society? As they write your story, are they going to write how you saved Christian America from all of its enemies or at least you started to strike back No, when they write your story, who gets the glory? Soli de gloria. God gets the glory because it's only his righteousness graciously given through resting in Christ. You, like Isaac, are sons of the promise, the result of God's miraculous work of grace. And who gets the praise and the glory for that? Only God. So the first thing why we hold to the gospel and the Protestant Reformation message is it's the gift of God. Secondly, although the gospel is unimpressive to the world and ridiculed, and even for people in churches today, the gospel seems to be, well, we've kind of covered that. Let's move on to some super important work. Even though the gospel is unimpressive in its scope, And it is mostly a future unseen reality where the real blessings are secured. You do have a great future in Christ. 
you know, let Ishmael live in Havilah with its gold for a season. Let religion fool themselves into thinking that they've done all these cool things. Ultimately, history will forget them, and God doesn't care. Let Ishmael live in Havilah. You have the new Jerusalem ahead. That's where our hopes and our focus need to be. And finally, friend, religion, although it draws a lot of people, people get excited about it, religion will fail. Did you know that J. Gresham Machen, the founder of the OPC, uh, he was one of the only Protestant leaders in the 1920s to oppose having schools teach the Ten Commandments and pray in public schools? I think, what? That sounds crazy. Machen was a liberal? No. Machen said, we don't want to have the, the husk of religion without having the kernel, the reality of the gospel taught. It would be terrible to have public schools giving, they're not going to teach the gospel clearly, and they're not going to pray to the true living God through the mediating work of Jesus Christ, the only Savior. They're just going to have this generic moralism. And so Machen said, religion and moralism, okay, that may be uh, good for civic culture at some level, but you're going to be graduating kids who think that they're Christian and who don't know the gospel. Religion will fail. Religion is at odds with the gospel. We are called, friends, to be children of promise. People who exalt in the solas of the Reformation and who fix our hope on Christ's finished work that will bless us in the future. That's where we need to look. And that's where Genesis 25 ultimately points us to. Let's go before God's throne in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the good news. And Lord, we see that... um, Well, we thank you for your grace because, Father, we're prone to be drawn to religion. We're prone to be like the lawyer in Luke 10, the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. We desperately want to know, Lord, just tell us what we have to do. And yet, Lord, your answer is always the same. You can't, we cannot do enough. That's why we need to just rest in Christ's work. We pray, Father, that as the world gets crazy and our culture continues to experience all the things that you predicted, that we would rest in Christ. And that the gospel would not be something that we've grown beyond, but that the gospel would be our daily hope, our confidence and the message that we share with a world that's dying. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.